Hello, everybody. I am Laura Sheehan, and I'm so excited to welcome you to this session of Empowering Perspectives, an inspiring interview to ignite your inner spark. Today, I am joined by Lauren Flaherty, who is a certified life strategist, career, and executive coach. Lauren, like most of us, or maybe not most of us, some of us, considers herself a master at reinvention. In her coaching practice, her coaching model is to accept where you are, create where you want to go, and transform. Together, this is called the ACT, A-C-T, coaching model, and is used as a way for clients to visualize their goals and create manageable steps to accomplish them. Today, we're going to talk about confidence building, and Lauren is going to walk us through a few steps that we can take ourselves to improve our own ability to move ourselves forward. Lauren, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I mean, I've got this little introduction, but I would love it if you could tell everybody about you. Absolutely. So as I mentioned, or as you mentioned, I believe I'm a master at reinvention and I have to be. I am part of a foreign service family. My husband takes us all over the world because of his career and I have to go with the flow. It's just part of the job. I started out in a career as an event planner and then I was taking a bus to New York City and this guy told me I'd be great at PR and he helped me revise my resume. So I decided, okay, a career in PR. And I ran into a girl who I was a, a camp counselor with on the streets of DC who happened to work in PR. She turned in my resume at that company and then I was working in PR. And then I became a TV producer and I was working for NBC, I was working for Discovery Channel, TLC, and all of that happened also because I leaned into opportunity. I was cast as a host for a TV show that didn't take off, and I really wanted to be in that industry, but I didn't want to be in as talent anymore. I wanted to be a decision maker. And so I ended up going to the National Association for Television Production Executives, this big trade show. It was the same year Ellen DeGeneres was selling her TV show. And I went to the NBC booth and I met a young woman who was a page. And I learned what the page program was. And mind you, I was still working at the PR firm. I was a manager of different folks. And I was earning a pretty good salary for my 20s. And I basically emailed the president of NBC Enterprises and said, from NAPP to the PAGE program, this is what I want to be. And he wrote me back. And he wrote me, call me. So I picked up the phone at seven in the morning, my time, 10, no, it was 10 in the morning, my time, seven in the morning, his time in California. And I gave him a call and I had put my resume in probably four or five times to the page program, the one in New York, the one in California, and nobody would give me the time of day. I think they say 20,000 people apply to be a page every month. It's harder than getting into Harvard. And it's really about who you know. And I basically said, I'm going to be flying myself out to California for my brother's business school graduation. And I would love to meet with you. And he said, put it on the calendar. So I did. That's how I became a page at NBC. It's how I launched my career in television. And so many of the stories that I share are about leaning in, about taking a chance, and about having the confidence to do it. That is awesome. And I have not heard that story before. I love how you just sent the email. Yeah. And put it out and there. I yeah, I think about that a lot because a lot of my clients will not take that chance. They might not send the email or pick up the phone nowadays, especially. And there's no harm in doing it. Just pick up the phone, just send the email because you won't be in a worse place than where you started. So you might as well take a chance. Well, and there's this little voice in our heads that always says, who am I to be sending that email? Or why in the world would the, was it the president of NBC respond to my message? 
It was the president of NBC Enterprises at the time. His name is Ed Wilson, really great guy. And every person is different, but he taught me that no matter who you are, you still care about the people who are coming into that industry. It's all about supporting people and taking care of the people around you because eventually you'll be at the top and you'll be in that amazing position to be able to help someone else. So it's just always about remembering the journey that got you where you are. I love that. That's always one of my favorite questions to ask people is how did you come to be here? Because there are so many different ways that we end up in the places, literally. And I mean, in terms of physical location and also just in our lives, how we ended up where we are in our lives. And you, Lauren, I mean, you have really done it all in terms of being an expat partner, a wife, a mother, event planner, marketing, PR, um, doing your acting, directing, now coaching. Now, along in all of those different roles in all of those different locations and places and, and jobs and titles, is there one big challenge that you can think of that stands out among the rest? We'd love to hear about that and how you overcame it. So when I think about challenges, I think about decades. So in my 20s, the biggest challenge was being taken seriously. It was all about being sort of a young woman transcending the ranks in different industries. And one story that comes to mind when I was working in PR, I worked at this incredible uh, public relations firm called APCO Worldwide. And they empowered people, they were promoting, they were really empowering young people like me to lead the charge. And I was working with a client who was more of a traditional type client. And every time I did something well, this particular client would say, good girl. And that didn't feel good, right? It felt demeaning. It felt, yeah, it just didn't feel great. And APCO was this place that really lifted me up and supported me. And they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't accept that kind of behavior, even from a client. I mean, they're an incredible place to work. But when I think about those times, even in my first position, when I was an event planner, I was working in a trade association and I wanted to spread some office cheer. And so I would bake people cakes for their birthdays. I got in trouble because I might forget someone's birthday. That is not allowed in this space. The interesting thing is that you're trying to find your place. You're trying to find what your skills, your gifts, your strengths, where they fit in. And I was a nurturer. I believe I was put on this earth to build community. It is my essence. It's what I do. And so discovering how that works in my 20s was very different than in my 30s. In my 30s, the biggest challenge was kind of traveling with my husband around the world, raising, raising children, figuring out how I could have this work-life balance. What does a career look like when you're moving from place to place? What do you do, right? Because I was a TV producer before I started traveling and I was working 16 hour days when I had my first child. So there was really no room for that. So I had to take a break and focus on my family. It was, I, I noticed, I think that it was, it was I'm trying to think, Madeline Albright. I think Madeline Albright was the one that said, you can't have it, you can have it all, just not at the same time. And so she's somebody that really inspires me and she had four kids and then later in life really built up her career. But it's a little voice in my head that you don't have to do everything at exactly the same time. And so when you're taking a challenge, break it apart, break it down, take many steps, do part of it, and then another part, and then another part until it's complete. And so I think in my 30s, I went back to work for a month, and then I couldn't, and then I was traveling with my husband. And it, I guess in Dubai, I focused on my family, and then I moved to Jordan. I was pregnant with baby number three, 
and I was at the Marine Corps ball and this incredible man named Silvio Gonzalez who was the information officer for the state department there sing his praises he basically said what do you do and I said well my husband saves the world and I like to entertain it and he said what does that mean and I was like well I, I was a tv producer and I love helping people create in incredibly new inventive content. I love that. So all of a sudden I was invited to look at the videos that were going out of the embassy. And so I went in just on my own time and I started looking at the videos and I was noticing places where I could be helpful. You know, I was teaching them how to write a story, how to sort of piece it together. And all of a sudden that led to a position I ended up becoming the broadcast production manager for the videos that went out of the embassy. And it was a place in my life where I was feeling insecure. I was feeling I hadn't been working for four or five years because I'd been in Dubai for four years. I had two children at that point. And so I was feeling sort of inconsequential. And that moment, was huge for me because all of a sudden, this person told me I had value. And all of a sudden, when someone else tells you, you have value, you begin to believe it yourself. And so I went in there and I didn't actually know what I was going to do in there as the broadcast production manager. I, but I went in and I started meeting with people around the embassy about different projects that they wanted or things that weren't going well and it started to come to me like all of the creativity was coming back and the more people were excited and inspired about different projects the more creative energy I was getting and the more I was able to include people and build the community at the embassy yet again so it's all about leading in that's interesting, though, that you were just talking about how you did have those moments of doubt and that the thing that brought you back up was having someone else tell you that you had value. So when you have those moments of doubt, how do you, or I should say, let's switch it a little bit. When your clients have moments of doubt, how do you coach them through those moments? So I believe that everyone needs support in their life. Everyone. Everyone. Uh, I coach women leaders and it's lonely at the top. So you have to build that support, whether it's a friend, a parent, a cousin, or a coach like one of us, there's got to be a dynamic of support in order to build that within you. So you can have the confidence, absolutely, but somebody saying yes, 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 that is something great about you, only lifts it even further. So I really truly believe that having that support in your life is one of the main contributors to building your own confidence. Did you have, or did you cultivate a support group outside of your friends and family? Because and I ask this because, of course, I mean, I love my husband. I, I tell him my crazy ideas and the things I'm doing. He's like, that's great. And I think, okay, <laughs> you know, I'm glad that my husband approves. Or I tell my mom and my mom says, oh, I love that idea. But I discount that support or that affirmation because I feel like they're telling me those things because they love me. So is there, do you, do you also seek or do you work to cultivate that support outside of your inner circles. Absolutely. And not only do I cultivate it, I build it. So I will get into a community. Let's say, so I was in Jerusalem and I was noticing that things were a bit contentious. It was, it was tricky living there. And you have your support, meaning the consulate or the embassy that you're with. And you certainly have the support of the other spouses that are there. But it all goes back to that community building, right? And that confidence and sort of honing in on your gifts. So at the school, it was a bit tricky. And I noticed that adults, parents in particular, are creatively starved. And so what I did was I created the parent theater players. And the parent theater players, the main purpose 
was to bring a storybook to life for book week and to teach the kids to stand up against bullying, all about kindness and inclusion. And in a, in a place like Jerusalem, inclusion is really, really important. So I directed this play and then I led a discussion with all the kids afterwards. And this was going to be a one-off, but the parents were like, I want more. It was eight rehearsals. There were parents that were working full-time, part-time, and staying at home, working from home. And it was this incredible experience. So that year, I directed another thing. I directed a teacher talent show, parent pantomime evening to raise money for the school. And so all of a sudden the teachers got to be creative and the kids are watching adults get up there and do things that are out of their comfort zone. And not only is it inspiring the other adult, adults in the room, it's inspiring these kids to say, okay, well, if they're willing to do it, then maybe I'll do it too. And so it's this, it's building, you know, it's building on itself. And so when I go back to, you know, when, when I talk about support or your question, support doesn't always look like somebody telling you have a great idea. Sometimes support looks like somebody jumping on board and saying, okay, I'll give it a try. I've never done that before, but why not? And so that's what I mean about building it, figuring out what your passion is and then making sure that you do it in life. Because if you are doing it in life, then you're probably inspiring the people around you to do your thing or their thing. What I love the most about this whole concept of the play and the pant parent pantomime group that you formed are that both of those activities really focus on creativity and play. And in a lot of the conversations that I have around confidence, we talk about how confidence essentially takes practice. And then if you look back and, or, and, or if you look at it in terms of experimentation, right? So be a scientist when you're in life where you got to just try something and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, okay, you've still learned something from that experiment and you try it again and you try it again. Or even when you're watching your kids learn how to walk, they take one step and they fall, they take another step and then they fall, but then eventually they try it so many times that they're able to do it on their own. And what fascinates me too about the whole concept of play and creativity and experimentation is that the word confidence itself has its roots in Latin, confidere, meaning with faith. And it's only after experimenting and trying and trying and trying again that you have the faith that you know that you will be able to take that next step, that you have the confidence to keep trying and to keep moving forward. So this awesome these awesome initiatives with the play and with the parent pantomime and with all of the other incredible creative groups that you have brought together, it really, and, and like you said, for the kids to see the parents doing it too, trying something new and being playful and lighthearted and having fun, instead of everything always being so serious and heavy. Yes, definitely. Well, uh, when we moved to California after Jerusalem, the interesting thing that happened about the reinvention part of the journey for me is that I didn't know what I was going to be. I didn't know what I was going to do. My big idea was that I was going to start the Broadway 5K, where we were going to have different show tunes for five different miles, and we were going to be wearing boas and fun things and raising money for the arts and schools. So that what I often do is I dream about what may be. And then when I land in a place, I think about my dream, and then I listen to what's going on around me. And then I figure out what I'm actually going to do. And so what I discovered in California was that the parents were, again, creatively starved. And it was very interesting because my son was in his very first play ever. And he was not going to join. It was the fifth grade play. He was anxious. He, he, he was just really uncomfortable. 
So we decided to go to one rehearsal to see if it was going to work. And he had his, his hands like clenched and he was just so anxious is the only word I can think of. And finally, he's watching them do some type of play exercise. And he had a little hoodie on and he put the hoodie down and he was like, I'm going to do it. And so it was 20 minutes of anxiety and then this moment of confidence. So he goes down, joins the play. It was really his first play ever. I mean, not related to like a school thing that you had to be in. And all of a sudden he was auditioning and singing in front of a whole bunch of people. I had never seen him do that before. I was the one that was always on the stage and he never was. It was surprising and exciting. And the thing I love about it is that to me, that wasn't who he was. It wasn't who he was, but he made it who he was. And so when we put these boundaries on ourselves where that I don't do that, that's not me. Um, so many of them and, and adults are often doing it even more than kids are doing it. We limit ourselves. We really, really do. And we limit ourselves for the opportunities that are being presented to us on a daily basis. There are so many ways to lean in. People are offering suggestions all the time, like the guy on the bus. You know, it's so interesting when somebody says, what do you think about this? And, and you say, yes. And that goes to the number one rule of improv, which is yes and. Yes and essentially means that you take what somebody says, accept it, and build on it. And that's kind of how I like to live life. And so what happened in California was that I noticed that in my son, and then his director basically was uh, asked me if I wanted to be her, her assistant or something like that, where I would answer her emails. And I said, let's have a meeting. And I was, I think I was working out or something. And I'm like, I don't want to answer her emails. I have enough emails that I don't answer on my own. I don't want to do that. But why did I want a meeting? What, why did I say yes to a meeting? What did I want to do? And so went to this coffee shop to meet her. And I decided that I wanted to create an adult education program at her local community theater because the adults in Lafayette were not being served. They were not having any opportunity for creativity. And so that is where this whole storytelling and acting program I co-created started. So yeah. So anyway, all the stuff that happened in Jerusalem, then launched it in California. And then in California, it started with the same stories that you bring to life for elementary schools. And then we decided we wanted to do middle schools. So we created a middle school workshop dealing with mental health and anxiety and depression using improv. And then we decided we needed to serve the high schools. So we decided we, we created the Young Playwrights Festival. So we went in and gave playwriting workshops. And then the high schoolers were given the opportunity to um, submit 10 minute plays. So we read through 18 10 minute plays and picked seven that were fully produced uh, by professional actors and directors in the area and created the Young Playwrights Festival. And so again, I bring up all these things because one thing led to another, led to another. I didn't do all of it at one time. It was one thing worked and then you have the confidence to build another thing and then you have the confidence to build another thing. And that's what life is all about. Agreed. And I would love to go back, if you don't mind, to the sure. improv exercise that you just mentioned called Yes And. And you use that in your coaching practice, correct? All the time. Okay. Tell us about it. How do we do it? So Yes And is not an improv exercise. It's the rule of improv, Ooh. but you can do it every day. <laughs> so essentially you basically are accepting what somebody says and building on it in a positive way. So let's say, Laura, where do you want to go on vacation post pandemic? Hmm. Fiji. <sighs> Wouldn't that Fiji. Be yes. Yes. And 
we should go to Fiji by boat so that we can see the water as we get there. Yes. You- mm-hmm. And we should be sure to eat lots of amazing fresh seafood while we're there. Yes. And then when we take the seafood, we can actually freeze it in ice blocks. And then when we take those ice blocks, we can put them in a special cooler so that we can bake them in the sun on our way back home. Yes. And we could probably save some for our friends and family who weren't able to come with us to Fiji, bringing Fiji to them. Yes. And you know what else we could do is we could take the bones of the fish and make jewelry for our (laughs) friends and family as souvenirs. Yes. (laughs) And I'm sure they would love that. (laughs) (laughs) They can smell like Fiji. (laughs) So (laughs) the essence of that activity is, especially when you're in a brainstorming session with a team of people, when you set the groundwork, you set the rule as a yes and rule. At first, it might seem a little bit silly, right? To make, put things in ice blocks or whatnot. But what it does is it gets people to stop thinking about why ideas won't work. And it gets them to start thinking about why they will. And once you start thinking about why ideas will work, then you really launch yourself into a creative space for critical thinking. And that's what we all really want to do. We want to think creatively. We want to think critically. We want to come up with the best idea together that we can because truly the the person who has the idea that works in the room isn't necessarily the smartest person in the room. They're just the person who's the most confident. They're the person who's willing to own their idea, say their idea and get everyone else to agree with it. But if everyone had that same amount of confidence, then you can really look at something and you could an idea can have a part that's brilliant and then something that can be even better with someone else's input. And so that's really the goal of brainstorming and creativity and using improv in the workplace. Awesome. And I wanna, I'm gonna mention now that you had an article, a recent article in Confidence Nation. And in that article, you, you went through and you talked about three different tools that people could use to build confidence now. What, and was the yes and exercise one of them? So yes and was mentioned in the article, but the three things that I talk about was really a, a response to negative self-talk. One of the number one reasons that people lack confidence is because you know what I think people have twelve to sixteen thousand thoughts during the day, and eighty I think it's eighty percent are negative, and they're repeated negative thoughts. And so, the thing about that is that if you make that switch and you make a conscious effort to have positive thoughts, and Laura, you might say, how can you just have positive thoughts, <laughs> right? But one of the things I suggest is post-it notes. I believe in post-it notes. I really, really think that they work partly because they're just another message that's coming at you. And it's a message that you have carefully crafted, created that works for you. So if I have a client and my clients have fabulous ideas, they are smart, smart, really engaging individuals. Oftentimes I'm like, write that on a post-it, write that on a post-it. And so, you know, if you wake up in the morning and there's a post note on your mirror that says, you are valuable, you are amazing, you have great ideas, then it's replacing the, the stuff that's going on in your brain with that. And it's, it's looking at you every day. And so on your computer, a lot of people have a fear when it comes to talking over Zoom, right, in this virtual space. But if you had a post-it right next to your computer that said, you have great ideas, you are valuable, What what you think matters, sometimes it's just that extra push that you need to get over that fear of speaking your ideas 
on a meeting. And so I really, really believe that having these visual cues is an opportunity for you to replace some of that negative self-talk. I also really love, sorry to interrupt, that you chose examples that were very specific. And what we hear, I think, most is the mantra, I am enough. And I think that sells people short. I want to think not that I'm just enough, but that I am awesome and valuable and that I do have great ideas. And I would love to see more people replace that I am enough mantra with I am fantastic or I am awesome or (laughs) all of the things that you just mentioned. So thank you for, for giving us those, I think, much more powerful options for visual cues on how to build our confidence. What are the tools that you use? Um, Another one I really love, I love doing this with my clients. um, We make a rainy day list. So what that means is they just tell me about themselves. They tell me about awards they were proud of that they won when they were little, uh, about something that they said in a meeting that really resonated with the room. You could see it resonating with the room. Promotions that they've gotten, achievements, or even just having a good day, right? Feeling like they had a really great day and describing it to me. And so as we have this discussion, I just take lots and lots and lots of notes. And after that session, I send it to them as a gift. And I say, all of these things are what's special about you. It's what's unique about you. It's what makes you the amazing person that you are. And so when you're having one of those bad days, This is what you need to open to remind you about how special you are. And it's really wonderful to do the rainy day list with another person. You can do it on your own very easily, but having it sent from someone else is really nice or in someone else's handwriting because it's a shared moment and connection, as you know, is so important in, and again, it goes back to that support that you create someone that you trust giving you this gift. You know what else is so great about that method, Lauren, is that um, as coaches, we get to listen to people describe a scenario or a situation or a problem or challenge that they're facing. And one of my favorite things that we get to do as coaches is repeat the words that those people, that our clients use to describe any one of those scenarios. And what's so fascinating is that the person can use the words themselves, but then only when they hear them played back from someone else, does it actually sink in that they're choosing those particular words. And so by you listening and writing down the words that you're hearing, repeating the words that your clients are saying to you, and then sending them back to them, I think it's more, so much more than me writing it down for myself, for example, because you have heard your client's words through your filter, and those are the words that made it through, and they were theirs, but to have them reach the level of importance or value to make it through your screening mechanisms also adds value to what they're saying. So it really, that's an incredible gift that you give your clients. That's awesome. I love it. I love love the idea of saying, of even writing to my client, I love picturing you winning the little league championship, you know, something like that, that adds that connection. And then what's the third and final tool that people use every day to help with their clients? Yes. The third and final tool is called alphabet accolades. I came up with this with a client who was struggling because her boss was constantly taking credit for her good work. And so how often does that happen for us? Something really great happens and somebody says, oh, because of that conversation we had, you went and got the promotion or, you know, it's, it's subtle. It's so subtle, but there's something there when somebody is taking some of the credit, part of the credit for something great that's happened to you. And so this was a real struggle for my client and it was coming up quite often in our sessions. And so one of the things about that is that 
nobody gets to take your power away. You give it away, but no one, no one gets to take it. And so the point is don't give it away. Keep your power for yourself. And the tool that we came up with in the session was to notice that her boss was doing it again. And so we would take the first letter of her boss's name, which was Z, and then put accolades on the end of it. So, oh, it's, you know, boss Z having to take credit again. It's another Z accolades moment. And so the comedy of noticing that she needed that for herself was the thing that allowed my client to let it go and to take her power back and to feel confident and to feel proud of whatever she had achieved that day. So it's a very easy tool, but it's very effective when you're noticing that someone else is doing that. Say, oh, it's another moment that they need in their life to feel important. They needed it more than I did. It's a Z accolades. It's a C accolades. It's a D accolades. Yeah, whatever that name is and just insert it there. That's incredible. Yeah. It's nice to be able to take it back. Yeah. Yes. Got to keep our power. Well, and that then leads us to, I mean, most of your work, as you have mentioned, is with women leaders. And Earlier in the conversation, well, I guess let's start with what, I mean, we talked about challenges that you've overcome. What are you noticing are the biggest challenges that female leaders are facing today? I mean, you, of course, being a leader yourself, but amongst your clients as well, what, what are they bringing to you? Themselves. The biggest, biggest challenge that women leaders are facing today are themselves. It's imposter syndrome. It's you know, being thrown into a leadership role and being not confident, <laughs> um, feeling like they don't have what it takes to do the job. Other people are more qualified. Other people have the skills. Why me? What if they find out that I'm not qualified? This person is super good at technical stuff and I'm not good at technical stuff. They're going to find out. It's a lot of, a lot of they're going to find out. And Women, men, people who are put into these roles, you've been put into these roles for a reason. There's something really special about you, what you can bring to the table. And so you've got to dig in there and know what it is. And that brings me to another rule, which is ABC, always be certain. It doesn't mean you have to make anything up, but when it comes to your strengths, know them. When it comes to a great idea that you have, say it with pride. ABC, always be certain because having the confidence or presenting confidence is often the thing that your team is looking for in a leader. And again, it doesn't mean making stuff up or pretending. Knowing your strengths and seeing the strengths in others is the key. You want to surround yourself with people who do great things, and you want to have the confidence in yourself to be able to see it in those people. And so when you have this team and you're building it, an exercise that you can do is really a strength finders exercise. There's this great website called viacharacter.org, and it's wonderful because I think it's the top the 24 or the top religious leaders and world leaders uh, basically came up with 24 different character traits that they believe are the traits that transcend all these different religions value system. And you take this survey and it comes up with the three things that are your top values. And when you look at that, you get to see the world through your strengths and your eyes sort of a positive psychology kind of thing. Um, but it really, really comes down to confidence because again, when you know your strengths, then you are open to seeing those strengths in others and building the team that you want. I also, I love that you're talking about 
certainty both in your strengths and also in your values. Because one of the things that I've run across a lot with, with my clients, in fact, I had a conversation just yesterday with one of them, was that when we went through a skills evaluation or, or a look at their pivotal moments in life and what made people pivot. And for you and me, a lot of our pivots in life are because we choose to follow our husbands in their careers. And we chose to take a break from the traditional um, corporate world to care for our kids. And many people internalize those choices as weaknesses or as things to be ashamed of because we didn't stay on the career, the traditional career path, or we didn't choose to make our career the same priority as our husband's. And the conversation that I was having with, with this particular client and that I've had repeatedly is that once, and and even for myself, once I was able to say, yes, That was my choice. That was what I chose to do because family is important to me and because it was important to me to stay home for those years or it was important to me to try my best to keep our family together. Um, And once I was able to recognize those values and once my clients were able to recognize those individual values, then it makes those decisions both future decisions makes them so much easier because you know what your values are and you stay aligned with your values. And it also gives you that acceptance of the decisions that you've made in the past to know that you were acting in alignment with things that were important to you. So to to have both that skills component and that values component in your decision-making process. And like you have been saying, to be certain about both of those. As soon as you're clear on those things, then it just makes so so many decisions so much easier. You are so right. And what you're describing is a shift in perspective. And that's one of the number one things we want to do in coaching, right? And so what resonated with me is that as I was traveling with my husband for his career, I started looking for the opportunities rather than the hindrances, like all the exciting things that might happen versus all the things that I wasn't getting because I was doing that. And once you look at the world with opportunity, then all of a sudden you're free to lean into it when it finds you, when you find it. So it's really special and it's really great that you are coaching your clients that way. And they are so lucky to have that. They really are because we all need to hear that. We all need to remember that we have choices. Sometimes it doesn't feel like we have choices. Sometimes we feel so stuck and so locked in, but we do. And once we notice that it's a choice, then all of a sudden it becomes positive versus negative. It's wonderful. Yes. Yeah, it is. And I love too how you have so clearly articulated how to spot and grab opportunity. And whether that is at a, you know, an executive level or, you know, at an entry level, you know, switching careers or finding new jobs or starting a new initiative, being open to those conversations, talking to people, seeing what is going to come out of those conversations and being excited. I love that you use the word excitement and to see what is going to happen rather than dreading all the things that you're leaving behind or that haven't happened. Yeah, that, that is definitely one of the most important things to do when it comes to your perspective, because you have that choice. Again, you have the choice to look forward or to look back. And if you're moving as much as we do, then looking forward is the choice I choose to make. Well, and you just moved again back to uh, Maryland area of the United States. So what is next for you? So here I am continuing to build my coaching practice. Once this pandemic is over, I have a dream of, of bringing my theater, my adult theater experience here and working with my co-creator who's still in California and sort of doing it coast to coast. And I am working on a book. 
So the book that I'm, that I am working on is all about dreaming big dreams and breaking it down so that there are practical steps to getting there. And I actually believe that you should never stop dreaming. I think that you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you should still be having dreams, whether it's to be an artist, whether it's to travel, whether it's to be part of a big family, whatever the thing is, because even a dream to be part of a big family is something you can create. And so I just believe in people dreaming big dreams and helping them make them happen, make them come true. That is awesome, Lauren. Thank you so, so much for your time today, for all these great insights, for your sharing your personal stories, your challenges, the way that you've overcome them and the way that you're helping others to do the same. I can't wait to read your book. I can't wait to see the new community that you create in Maryland and to watch it grow across the United States. It's, it's all, we'll just keep using the same words, so exciting to see how you are creating. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here and I really appreciated the time with you today. You're wonderful. Likewise. Well, thanks everybody for joining and we will look forward to seeing where Lauren takes this next stage in her life and to hearing from the rest of you about your stories and your journeys along the way. Thanks so much for joining today.